Hi, friends, and welcome to Perfect Practice. Today, I have with me April Stroink. April is a money coach, and her and I actually met at a recent event that Megan Walker was hosting. We got to meet in, in person finally, and uh, she's here to support us clinicians who are also entrepreneurs in our money journey. Money is such a huge uh such a huge thing for us to consider, and it can be very taboo as clinicians for us to think about and talk about. And, uh, and one of the things that we struggle with as practitioners is knowing what our numbers mean. So at the event, you know, I was there speaking about, you know, upcoming, you know, trends and health and wellness and data was one of those things. And just like we have an aura ring to track our sleep, which is an important metric, we need to know what our numbers mean in our business so that we can actually see if what we're doing is working. Some of us may be actually in a much better position than we think. And some of us may be in a slightly different position in a negative way than we think. And numbers, as we say, don't lie. So we're going to be talking about how to best think about money, how to position it in your mind, how to overcome limiting beliefs surrounding money, what numbers to look at, how to quantify them, and then how to course correct if necessary. And then also not just to have a short-term immediate money strategy, but what's the long-term vision that you have with your money. So I would like to invite April uh, to our stage. And I know you're going to really love the conversation and dialogue that we're going to have today because it applies to each and every one of us. So no matter where you are, whether you're just starting out or running a seven-figure practice, there's always going to be a ceiling that we come up against and an awareness that we come up against. And sometimes it can be blind to us. So today, I hope that we can crack that code for you, help you look at money as your greatest ally and friend in your business and help you make more of it, but more importantly, save more of it so that it can do some work for you as well. Uh, with that being said, April, thanks for joining me today. I'm happy to be here. Well, let's create some operational definitions. I know that you know, you're speaking to healthcare practitioners and you would describe yourself as kind of a wealth care practitioner. So tell me a little bit more about what that means to you. Absolutely. So um, as you know, as we've talked about before, is that wealth care and, and your financial well-being is so interconnected with your physical health and your mental health and uh, your close relationships as well. And so it's really important for us to understand what's happening in our finances if we really want to truly get healthy. I believe that uh, finances is, is one of the pillars of overall good health because it is one of the major stressors for most people. And of course, we know when the body is under stress, uh, it releases cortisol, which of course does nasty things to our bodies. But also it's, you know, sleep is such a big factor. And I know a lot of people self included that if I'm stressed about money, and my head hits the pillow, all of a sudden, I'm running all the numbers in my head, and then my sleep is impacted, my mental health is impacted. And uh, we're both based in Canada. And in Canada, money stress is the number one reason for relationship breakdown in this country as well. And so we need to be looking at our financial health as one of the pillars to good overall health and well-being. So I love that. And uh, I'd love to know what inspired you to get into this space. Where did, where does your career start that's uh, now led you to helping practitioners? Well, I've been in the financial space since 1999. And so I was classically trained, if you will, as a financial advisor. And one of the things that I was really noticing uh, was that we were trained to get people to retirement and to make sure that they had their financial safety net in place. But one of the things that in my extensive training and schooling that I was not taught was about behavioral finance. And as you said earlier in the introduction, you know, money doesn't equal math. It's also emotional. So we need to know the mechanics of how money works, but we also need to know our behaviors and our mindset. And so in studying behavioral finance, um, really understanding that we have these cognitive biases in our brain that make us do things with money that we would never do with other areas of our lives. 
And so, you know, I would be working with clients uh, who are making good income, but would be saying things like, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. And the more money that I make, the less disposable income I have. I'm drowning in debt, student loans, business loans, practice loans, what have you. But my retirement's taken care of, um, or I have my insurances in place, but I am stressed about the day to day. And so that's really in 2017, I really shifted my practice to getting away from assets under management and really taking a look of helping people on the other side in more of the coaching side of things of let's understand your spending behaviors, let's understand uh, your emotions around this so that we can get ourselves to reaching those financial goals. Because like I said, you have to know the mechanics of how money works and the mindset to bring it, the two together. And along the way, I've been very in tune with my wealth care, but also my health care. Uh, health is really important to me and my family. And uh, my child, my youngest child was really sick as nine months old. As soon as I stopped nursing her, she just was constantly sick. And so the traditional medicine was constantly giving this poor little baby more antibiotics and more antibiotics. And she just got sicker and sicker. And I was just told it's just the way it is. And I'm a second child. She's just going to be sick. And I'm like, I don't believe that. So I started advocating for my child's health and looking for other alternatives and came across naturopathic medicine. And in that case, working with an ND as part of her healthcare team, I literally had a new child on my hands within 48 hours. And so I really started to make the connection of I was trained in this classical financial spot and it wasn't serving my clients until I really started to look at their entire picture of their wealth care. And that's what I find naturopathic doctors and functional medicine professionals is they're looking at it in a whole uh, place and being part of that team. And so I found that my approach to wealth care was similar to this community and it really clicked for me. And so that's where I really started to work with, um, with this community. I love that. It's uh, it's wonderful to be able to pay it forward, right? Somebody helps you and uh, your family in a profound way, and you're able to now pay it forward to an entire community and segment of the population, uh, which are practitioners who unfortunately, including myself, lack perhaps the financial acumen. Uh, we perhaps may even know how to make money, uh, but maybe lack the skill set to keep it. Or some of us may even have limiting beliefs surrounding money. I'd love to know uh, how you help your clients overcome some of these emotional blocks that are surrounding money and, and how that's, uh, maybe you could even share a case study or a story of how you've helped over someone overcome the emotional block around money to then come out on the other side of it more successful? So I'm very much a data-driven person. Um, and so, as you said earlier, you know, the numbers don't lie. And so when we can really get good data, it takes the emotion out of, out of the equation. It's, well, it doesn't take the emotion out of the equation, but it gives you that solid foundation. Right. And so what I really work with with my clients is really stepping into what I call your chief financial wellness officer role inside of your practice. Um, and the three attributes of the CFWO is first of all, helping my clients become fearless when it, it comes to their numbers. And I don't mean like fearless, raw. I mean, without fear, as in you are going to open up your bank account and see that it's not so scary. We're going to open up those supplier bills. We're going to look at our financial numbers because I believe strongly that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. And so we know that fear is false evidence appearing real. And so when we actually know and bring it into the sunlight, we can name it, claim it, and then we can tame it. So really working on that fearless side of things and then I teach practitioners to become curious about their finances, because when we're in a state of curiosity, we're in a state of learner. And so we really need to be in this learner state. And 
I know to be true that this community loves learning and is ongoing lifelong learners. And so really adopting that mindset now to your numbers. And then when we have that fearless and learner curiosity mindset, what I find is people become passionate about their numbers or fall in love with their numbers. So we really, it's that journey of taking you from fearless to passionate about your money. And the way that we do that is again with showing the data and that it's not so scary and having that team around you, but I am very tactical. And so um, you wouldn't probably come to me for the mindset side of things. I know you had Garrett Gunderson on a couple of weeks ago and he was really talking about mindset, but what I'll show you is the mechanics that work with those cognitive bias that is that we have so you can really feel confident I'd say the biggest thing that I help clients with is increase and boost their confidence when it comes to their numbers and their finances I love that yeah it's important to have that certainty and even to know what numbers we're looking at which one of the numbers matters and uh, also uh, wealth preservation is another uh, important thing as entrepreneurs we have a unique ability uh, that you wouldn't have necessarily as an employee. When you're self-employed, you have some unique opportunities to, uh, you know, for, to, for tax savings, for for investing, and and um, you know, reinvesting back into your business. And knowing the numbers really helps you do that, and understands where helps you understand where you're getting the biggest return on your investment. What would you say are some you know little-known strategies uh, or ways that people can start uh, saving money? Because I think that's probably one of the easiest places for us to start is maybe getting rid of old subscriptions or, you know, going through their credit card bill and identifying recurring payments. Like what are, what are some ways that people can perhaps who are listening right now, maybe reclaim, you know, a 500 to a thousand dollars a month from things that are not serving them in their business anymore. So one of the big things that we have to realize, one of these cognitive biases that we have comes down to Parkinson's law and what Parkinson's law always state, states is that demand will always meet supply. And so that's why if we're given a task to do in a month, it'll take us a month. It's that same task given to us in a week, we'll do it in a week. And the same happens with our money. So we have this axiom as business owners that sales minus expenses equals profit. And so we're always driving top line sales, top line sales, top line sales. But what can happen is as we grow and we're not, and we're growing for the sake of growth, not strategically, we can increase our top line revenue, but lo and behold, our expenses increase as well. And now we've just grown this massive beast and we either have the same profit or in some cases we are less profitable than we were before. And so we really need to take a look at, first of all, your cost of goods sold. So what is the cost that's going into the products or services that you're bringing to your community? Because you really have to understand what is your gross margin per unit of everything that you are selling. And so really doing a deep dive into those costs of goods is going to be really important. And then from there, you wanna have as much margin as possible to run your operations or your operating expenses. And what I like to do with my clients on a regular basis is to conduct what I call an expense audit. And so we take a look at the expenses and we categorize them into three different buckets. The first being your P expenses or those expenses that drive profit. And usually those are your people and your team, but it may be other applications like you were saying that drive profitability. And unfortunately, when we come up with a cash flow challenge, our knee jerk reaction is to slash all of our expenses. And unfortunately, we, we slash those profit expenses. And then lo and behold, 10 weeks, 10 months later, yes, 10 days, we may feel, oh, this was a great idea. But then 10 months, 10 years later, we realize, oh my gosh, if I had only not had slashed those expenses or let go of those people, I would be so much further ahead. So you really want to be cognizant of what are those P profit driving expenses. Do not slash those, especially in times of cash flow challenge. But in some cases, you may actually want to amplify them. Can you, give second, an can you give an example of some of those, what they might be? Absolutely. So, you know, for me, when COVID hit, uh, I think for all of us, we may have gone into a bit of panic mode in regards to our business and starting to say, oh my gosh, you know, what are some things that I need to slash and burn or what have you? 
And so when I was going through this exercise, again, um, when we take a look at business crisis, that first knee jerk reaction is I've got to, I've got to get rid of every, everything. And I had worked so hard up to that point to have an excellent team in place on my admin side, on my marketing side, I have an analyst on staff as well. And so what I was thinking is that they're my biggest expense, I've got to minimize that. And so I worked actually with my coach through this and he walked me through the 10, 10, 10 method. And we said, okay, well, if we let my team go, yes, in the next 10 days, I will not have that expense. So that will make me feel great. But in the next 10 months, when we get through this crisis and we start to see the surge, I actually won't have this team in place. And how will I feel at that time? And how will that impede my business? And then in my 10 year trajectory, it would really put me back. And so really taking a look at what are the other things that I can maybe uh, slash or can I take less owner's pay or put less into my profit account so I can support keeping this team on payroll so that when I get through this current crisis, I actually have this team in place. And so if you take a look at some industries during the pandemic that really let go of team and culture And then all of a sudden they came back in the surge. I'm thinking like travel, the restaurant industry. They didn't have the people to meet the demand in order for them to recoup during those challenges. Mm. So you really have to think of those profit expenses. And mostly it's your team and your people, but it may also be programs. So I have a really expensive application that um, I have subscribed to and help build. And uh, if I had stopped the development of that, or even had uh, gotten rid of that, it's one of the key things of my program. And so letting go of the key thing of my program, it saves me time. It makes me unique. I wouldn't be as profitable. um, And I, I wouldn't be standing here today. I know that as a fact, if I had let that go in time of crisis. So what I see often is in time of crisis, people throw the baby out with the bathwater, maybe that's not correct, but like, just don't, don't the knee jerk reaction, stop and think of how is this going to impact you in 10 days, 10 months, 10 years, taking that 10, 10, 10 philosophy. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, us may have witnessed that in marketing, right? So people cut back on their marketing budget and they think they're saving themselves, but it's, you know, if your marketing is, is profitable, Right. And it's the light, really the lifeblood, you know, along with marketing and sales, the lifeblood of your business, you know, cutting things out that that are helping you generate sales or creating more awareness. That's I think that could be another example of how people shoot themselves in the foot. And Absolutely. what also what also happens is uh, advertising often becomes cheaper uh, when people are panicking because most people that's the first uh, budget that they cut is marketing, unfortunately. So you can actually leverage as an entrepreneur, you can actually leverage the cheaper, uh, you know, how, how much less money you spend on marketing in, in times of crisis like that. Absolutely. I like to see uh, anywhere from five to 10% being spent on marketing. Um, and so that's one of the things that, yeah, like you said, how are you going to get on the other side of this if you're not spending into, into marketing and into your people? Yeah. So we covered the first one, which yes. is, you know, making sure you're identifying uh, the expenses, not slashing the expenses that are generating profit for you. What are the other two? Yeah. So then your R expenses are your reoccurring expenses. And so that's where you're talking about those, uh, taking a look at those subscriptions and taking a look at your insurance. I actually just did this uh, before today. I just did this today and I actually had slashed $2,000 of insurance that I was paying for, um, for office and home insurance, $2,000, $2,000 a year, uh, wow. just by doing some research. And what I find as well is, you know, taking a look at when's the last time you looked at your EHS and is it doing what you want of it? And, you know, what are you paying for that? Is there another application out there that actually can work the way that you want it to, that may be less expensive or may save you time? So when's the Mm. last time you looked at those applications that you use on a regular basis? I did this with my team uh, last year. We've looked at everything. And ironically, we did a 360. We came right back to what we're currently using is what's best for my practice to save us time and to, and 
and it's not the cheapest, but it saves us time. And that's important as well. So really taking a look at those reoccurring and seeing, you know, with your POS system, is there a way that you could have less coming off? Is there a way with your cell phone packages? So really taking a look at those recurring expenses and they creep up, right? We click subscribe. Um, we think that it's something that we need. And then lo and behold, four months later, we're not using it. So why are we keeping it? And really taking a look at that. So you want to look at that on a regular basis. Yeah, then, great, great perspective. And then the last is your you expenses or those unnecessary expenses. And this is where it really gets down to emotion. And so that's why having a third party who is committed to the success of your business, but is not emotional about your business, taking a look and saying, okay, is this, is this necessary to have um, this office furniture in your clinic? Is it necessary to have all of this clinic space? Or right now, um, could that be something that we could look at in the future and sort of to be supporting uh, your profit? Because as you said, it's not what you bring in, but it's what you keep. And so you really need to be diligent at doing expense audit on a regular basis. Yeah, so important. You know, there's a there's a membership that I need to cancel, and as you're as you're speaking about it, I'm thinking about it. It's been on my to do list for like weeks. My wife's been telling me to do it. So as soon as we're done here, I'm going to actually go and cancel it and take it off the list. Uh, but it does add up. Right? You and it, yeah, I'm sending you an email to make sure you do as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, and it it's like sometimes we are emotionally attached to things, right? Or we might be like, oh, it's only like 15 bucks and, and, but you know, 15 bucks, you know, times 10 things adds up pretty quickly. And then you extrapolate that over a year or two years and it adds up even quicker. So I definitely think there's a opportunity for all of us to kind of break out our credit card bill. And my wife does this every month when she's, before she sends off the uh, accounting to the bookkeeper and all the numbers and receipts and everything to them. And every, every month I'll get an email. Are you still using this? Are you still using this? Are you still using this? And, awesome. uh, and, and so we do check in on that, but I can think of a few things that I've been emotionally justifying, but logically I need to, I need to let them go. And, and here's the thing with subscriptions, they're always going to be there, right? So mm -hmm. it's not like you can't join next month. If all of a sudden you see a, a need to start using something, you can always rejoin. Some things are a little bit easier to let go of than others like software. If you've already poured a lot of time, energy, effort into it, then it's a little bit harder to, uh, you know, stop those subscriptions. They're pretty sticky, but you know, something like an audible account isn't as sticky, right? Cause That's you right. keep your, keep your books. And then if you decide you need more credits, then, you know, you don't need a subscription. You can just, uh, buy the books as you need them. I also find that, um, a lot of business owners are also emotionally attached to the products and services and mm. that they are offering. And it may be your signature, what you started first started out with in your practice. And you haven't been keeping an eye on increasing the price for that product or service. And you haven't been keeping an eye on the cost of goods to go into that product and service. And so when we go into a deep dive and we dissect the top line revenue and see, okay, what is it that you're offering and what is your gross profit? Sometimes it can be disguised as not profitable because other products and services are boosting the profit margin. But when we do this exercise as well and really taking a look at which of those products and services are profit generators and which are profit detractors, what I find is the one that the, the clinician is really emotionally attached to because it's how they started practicing as soon as they were out of school and and it is not uh, generating the profit for them. So you want to look at both sides of the equation when you're really taking a look at keeping more than you're making. It's that top line in your P&L as well with your revenue and your cost of goods, as well as those operating expenses too. I love that. Thank you. Um, so I'd love to know where do... When practitioners start out, they probably have to learn a lot of this stuff the hard way, right? And it's one of those closets that we don't want to open, right? All of, it's like a big mess and we, we just keep putting it off. Uh, how do you help practitioners kind of pull that Band-Aid off to, to actually shine some light 
on these areas? What's what um, like? What's that conversation like? I'm curious as to what it's like from your perspective. Absolutely. Well, the first thing that we want to do is we want to make sure: Do you have the right people on your wealth care teams? Right. So just like on our healthcare team, we want to have all of the right players in place to optimize our health. You want to have the same inside of your practice to optimize your wealth. And so uh, in that case, you know, do you have the right bookkeeper that's providing you with the right data? Do you have your chart of accounts set up in a way that makes sense to you and your practice? Same with your accountant, your banker, your lawyer, your advisor, your financial advisor or coach. So I want to make sure that they have the right team around them because we need the data. And so a lot of times when I start working with a practitioner, we go to start building the systems inside of their business only to find out that the data is garbage. And so we really have to start there because just like if you're running a blood test or a lab for a patient and you're not running the right tests or labs, it's very hard to make a diagnosis and a treatment plan. It's the same with your wealth care. So we really need to start with, do you have the right data? So I take a look at their books and to see if they're organized in in the way that they're able to measure uh, what's important to them and, and inside of their practice. So it's about getting that right team on. A lot of practitioners don't understand what's the role of the bookkeeper in my practice versus what's the role in my account as my accountant. And then what's my role as the business owner. So they think it's a checklist of, okay, I got a bookkeeper, check that. I got an accountant, check that. Now I can forget about that side of my business and move on to the stuff that's fun. Well, I'm here to tell you that you just like you cannot advocate your health to anybody else. You cannot advocate your wealth to anybody else because at the end of the day, uh, if you're in Canada and CRA does an audit or, or, or what have you, it's you as the business owner who is 100% res- personally responsible. In Canada, bookkeeping is not a regulated industry. Um, so I do have interview questions that I get clinicians to ask when they're, when they're interviewing potential bookkeepers. Um, and so it's really the first step is getting that proper wealth care team in place so that we get the right data. Because without the right data, putting the rest of the systems in place um, is really a moot point because garbage in, garbage out, it's not going to help you. So that's really the first step is getting that team in place so that you can step into the role of chief financial wellness officer in your practice. Mm. So when you say wealth, right? um, Some people may not identify with that word. Uh, because some people might think I'm not wealthy. So I, I'd love for you to help us understand at what point um, do we start seeking services like yours or start thinking about these things? Because people who are just starting out, they may not think, oh, I'm wealthy. I need to think about my wealth and, and manage it in that regard. So what, what, are, what are some ways that pe- we can help people identify when it's necessary for them to look at this? Um, their business through this lens? I would imagine it's right away, but um, I'd love to hear your answer. Absolutely. I was just going to say, you know, it's that old uh, that old saying of when's the best time to plant a tree 10 years ago, when's the next best time now? And I have facilitated uh, thousands of courses for the, especially for the province of Nova Scotia. I'm an educator for the province of Nova Scotia. And we do a financial essentials 101 for entrepreneurs. And the number one feedback that we always get when we run that course is, I wish I had learned this when I first started my business. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, it's like anything else. If you get into, if you don't have the right habits when you first start your business, those bad habits with your finances will continue. And I always, I always think that Yes, a lot of businesses fail in the first five years, but they're actually the lucky ones because the ones that are hanging on past the five years and are getting into financial cash flow challenges and all of a sudden we see the business owner taking a second mortgage out on their home or cashing in their retirement savings to keep this afloat because of those bad financial habits that they started and are continuing on. And so my, like, honestly, I think that 
learning about finances should happen at a very young age. It should be conversations that are had in the home because it's still very much taboo. Um, in Canada, it's not always part of our curriculum in our formal education system. And so we all of a sudden become adults and we're supposed to just know what to do with it. And we've never been given the tools. And then a, a institution comes along that profits from us being in debt or profits from us being in the dark when it comes to our finances, steps in as our first teacher. And then all of a sudden those bad financial habits get instilled and they continue on and on until we get to this place where we have to confront it. It's kind of, I kind of think of it like we don't, we ignore our health until we're unhealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, we ignore our finances uh, until, I don't know, let's say a global pandemic comes along and then we're in hyperinflation and all of a sudden our, that cheap uh, money that was flowing to us all of a sudden stops. And now we're in this place of financial disease and we haven't taken the preventative steps that we needed to take for this day that was inevitably going to come. And so, yes, I think that you need to have this training as part of your practice management training in your colleges. And I think it should be taught in high school. And I think we should be learning about this immediately. Yeah, we, we definitely have three ways that people are enslaved. And uh, something I've been saying for a very long time, one is we enslave people with poor health. We don't really teach them anything meaningful about health uh, with poor wealth and uh, and just really not giving people the financial and, and wealth acumen that allows them to save on taxes, to maximize you know, their uh, income earning potentials and also understand their financial um, you know, tables and, and charts and, and reports that they should be reading as entrepreneurs. And we also enslave them with poor food choices. So these are the three most profitable segments of our, of our economy, right? Is health management, if we want to call it that, wealth management, and, and also the food industry. And it's quite unfortunate, but we do have to take these matters into our own hands. And the powers that be aren't necessarily interested in us, you know, uh, having that skill set. So it's not like the banks are going to teach you this. It's not like mm -hmm. the people who loan you money are going to teach you this, or the government's going to teach you how to save on taxes. That's like the conflict of interest for them. Right. Just like it's not the doctor's responsibility to teach you how to be healthy or the hospital's responsibility to teach you how to be healthy because it's frankly a conflict of interest for them. So we do have to take ownership over you know these areas of our lives. It can be uh, painful to look at because uh, of uncertainty. And I love what you're doing, which is giving people more confidence and awareness and looking at, you know, their numbers through a lens that allows them to be better at what they do, right? I think that if we can, if we, if we love what we do, we should be A, pouring money back into our business and B, eliminating things that are preventing us from doing that. And of course, we should also be paying ourselves because, um, you know, frankly, we have bills to pay as well. And uh, we want to make sure that we're feeling nourished through our business and we don't want money leaking in places that it shouldn't be. And having that awareness, I think, is is absolutely critical. And as you mentioned very early on, it's the number one cause of relationships falling apart. And as, as uh, you and I both know, stress is probably the number one reason people's health falls apart. So it's intimately related to how we show up in the world. And even as practitioners, if we don't have confidence and certainty, in our numbers, it's just, it's always there. It's always kind of lingering in the background and we can keep, you know, shoveling it under the rug or sweeping it under the rug, but eventually that's not going to, that's not going to serve us. So thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. And I appreciate you taking a special interest in holistic practitioners with a, a very holistic approach. I, I love to know where we can uh, direct people to learn more about your work. And I know you've got an upcoming course that's coming out. I'd love for you to share a little bit more details on that. Um, so I'm not sure when this ep this podcast episode is going to uh, air, but I do have a preventative wealth care um, workshop happening on January 24th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. And we are starting our wealth care 101 uh, program in on February 3rd. And that is walking through exactly what wealth care means and how to implement it inside of your practice. 
Um, otherwise, you can find me over on social, on Instagram under April Stroink and on Facebook as well. And um, I think you have my website too, uh, but I'd love to have a conversation uh, with you. So if people want to book in for a free consult, they can do that through the website as well. Okay. And we'll be sure to share those links. Um, April, what can people expect on that consultation with you? How can they best show up to be prepared to, uh, you know, to navigate this journey with you? Absolutely. So um, beforehand, there are some questions to sort of get you thinking of, of why you're showing up on the consultation, but I really want to know what is the impetus for you reaching out? What is your what's preventing you from sleeping at night when it comes to your finances. And then I also want to know how I can best serve you. And I really want to know, are you ready? Uh, because uh, we can think that we're ready, like just like it is in our health, but I really want to work with people who are ready to put the systems in place and to really make a, a difference. I'm My mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And so I really want to make sure that people are there and ready to, to do the hard work because I'm not gonna lie, it's it's not easy and you do have to follow through. So on that, in that 30 minute consultation, it's really about, you know, what is your impetus for reaching out to me and then how can I best support you and best serve you? All right. Wonderful. Um, any words of wisdom that you want to impart on people as we wrap up? Well, I just wanted to circle back to something that you said in regards to wealth and how we have this sort of axiom of what we perceive wealth to be. And wealth is very subjective. What I determine as wealth for myself would be completely different than what you determine as wealth for yourself. And I think this is one of the things around money is we've just been led to believe, you know, what is this definition of wealth? And so I want to unpack that and really talk about what does prosperity mean to you? And what does a purposeful life mean to you? And that's really what it comes to when we talk about wealth, you don't have to have a million dollars to say that you're wealthy. Um, you need to have a life that is fulfilling for you. And it doesn't matter what your income is. Um, it really matters on connecting your values with how you're spending your money. Yeah. And your time. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you. Have an amazing, amazing rest of your day. And we'll try to get this uh, out as soon as possible so that those who tune in can attend the training and happy to share this with our community as well. Cause I know that uh, we all need this. And thankfully a few years ago, I got wise and I surrounded myself with an amazing team and it's been, it's truly been life-changing, you know, to, to have somebody looking at these numbers, because it's not that I shy away from them. I just want to put my head down and focus and do work and serve my purpose and, and, uh, make my vision come true. So, you know, thankfully my wife is more of a numbers person and thankfully we've got somebody that's uh, supporting us in that regard. And it was, it was such a game changer for us to have that self-awareness, to know what's working for us, what isn't working for us, how to manage things and, and run a lean business that mm -hmm. uh, is self-aware. And so having that self-awareness with your health and also with your wealth creates a, a very, you know, um, illuminating, you know, uh, experience in life because you're taking care of yourself in so many different ways. And, and wealth care is a form of self-care uh, as you so succinctly described today. So thank you again. Thanks for the work that you're doing. And here's to abundance, uh, health and wealth in 2023 and beyond. You as well. Thank you.